Hello and welcome to today's talk about detente. This is going to be a individual level analysis of detente, or you know we could also think of it as triangular diplomacy, as well as the years immediately before and after it. Now the reason why this presentation will focus on an individual level analysis is because detente was really the initiative of Richard Nixon. And Nixon, being the US president, is working within a certain time frame. So he needed to get everything done within an eight year period with substantial progress made during his first term so that he could successfully run for re-election. So this is, presentation is going to focus on the immediate, you know, um, you know, the conversations that were had between the president and some foreign representatives between uh, Henry Kissinger and Joe and Lai in particular that will feature heavily in this presentation uh, because detente happened within a certain time frame. And Abby's presentation will focus on more the long-term consequences of detente and some some of those consequences we still live with today. So questions to keep in mind throughout this presentation is was detente successful in the short run? And was Nixon successful in taking America out of Vietnam from a position of strength? Because as we will soon see, the major, major, major driving force behind detente was ending the war in Vietnam. And so we're going to you know, kind of examine, was uh, the Nixon and Ford governments able to achieve their goals, both short run and long run? So I think it's kind of cool to think about this as sort of a Shakespearean epic where President Nixon is our Richard III. Uh, and so the whole presentation will kind of follow this sort of uh, format where we will talk about these events almost as though it's a Shakespearean play. And it is kind of on that scale of, of, of uh, epicness and drama. So President Nixon was, uh, as you can see here, a very hard working person. He was a student of history, uh, came from a humble middle class background, and uh, he had some military experience. And it's also worth keeping in mind that this is a man who had his demons, and we can't really, this is not a presentation on President Nixon him, uh, you know, himself and his life, but it is important to keep in mind. Uh, that, you know, it, it, it was a very eventful life uh, with a lot of ups and downs. And um, it's really important to keep in mind that Nixon did spend eight years as Eisenhower's vice president, during which time he got to know very many world leaders, among which was Charles de Gaulle, who actually taught him the word detente uh, because he had just talked about some of his long-term plans and things, things to do with China. Uh, and he mentioned this word while they were having lunch once. And uh, Nixon liked it so much that uh, he decided to use it as the name of his policy. And it's actually thanks to Nixon and Charles de Gaulle that detente entered the English language. Uh, so he won the 1968 election with a clear mandate to end the Vietnam War. Probably every other person that was running for president was going to promise the same thing. But I would argue that Nixon had a very unique approach to doing that, and that approach was detente, which might not have occurred with another president. Uh, a key, key, key supporting figure is Henry Kissinger, who we can interpret as Nixon's chief negotiator. So where all of the really substantial talks prior to Nixon's actual visit took place, Kissinger was representing the president. Um, and while the press at the time attributed detente to being Kissinger's idea, you know, at the end of the day, he certainly added and he certainly had a lot of influence towards the end of Nixon's presidency. Kissinger was effectively considered to be the co-president, but certainly, the idea of going to China in general was Nixon's idea, and Kissinger simply embraced it. 
And another major character in this epic is Joe and Lyme, who uh, we haven't really focused much on. We've focused a lot more on Mao. But Joe was the premier of China under Mao. And, you know, Joe, unlike Mao, he was deeply, deeply, deeply absorbed by daily governance of the country. He was one of the very few people actually keeping China together at the time. And, um, you know, there are reports, for example, that he actually went through and found that the people that did the reports did the math wrong and he would go and meticulously correct official estimates for rice production and grain production. You know, he was doing all the actual hard work of running the country while Mao was uh, throwing a wrench into things. But uh, enough said about that. So unlike a Shakespearean play, we don't have themes, we have issues. And these issues will come up again and again through this presentation. Number one and most important being the war in Vietnam. So Nixon had a secret plan to end the war. Uh, and he correctly believed, as we see here, that Americans were more opposed to the, to the draft than the war itself. And so when he made his speech appealing to the silent majority, he was essentially arguing that it would be unwise for America to simply just walk out of the war and let the whole region just fall to communism. Um, and so his uh, major slogans we'll see later were peace with honor and to win the peace. So another issue was Taiwan. And now here, Nixon's experience as vice president is extremely important because this is a picture of him meeting with Chiang Kai-shek while he was vice president. You can see he looks a lot younger there. And he had a very low opinion of Chiang Kai-shek. Um, he once said, according to his brother, that Chiang Kai-shek was a little man who was destined to rule no more than a little island. So that just goes to show you how he thought about uh, you know, Taiwan's government. Um, and he, from very, very, very early on, he had advocated recognizing mainland China uh, as the sole legal representative of the entirety of China. And another major issue was nuclear weapons. So we'll see later that the whole logic behind detente and this massive shift was that the U.S. would be willing to make concessions on a bunch of issues in return for Eastern Bloc concessions on a bunch of other issues. One of those issues was nuclear weapons and attempting to limit nuclear weapons proliferation. Uh, the era that we're talking of, uh, that we're speaking of today, the, the early 70s, late 60s. So uh, at that point, the U.S. still had a very large advantage over the United States in terms of nuclear weapons, but they were catching up. So, the exposition, the opening act. Nixon gets in the government, and right away, he begins to withdraw U.S. troops from Vietnam, and essentially letting South Vietnam take responsibility for leading its, its own defense. Uh, but at the same time, he actually escalates the war by attacking Viet Cong positions in Cambodia and Laos and actually convincing the government of Cambodia to attack Viet Cong positions on Cambodian territory. So he's really trying to up the ante here. Uh, he wants a peace deal. Um, but as we will see, the conversations going on behind the scenes were a little different. So there's a very popular theory that, uh, based on this quote that Kissinger is reported to have said, that the U.S. really was not interested in maintaining a permanent South Vietnam government. Rather, they were more concerned with having an adequate time frame or an adequate interval between the withdrawal of the last U.S. soldier and the collapse of the Saigon government. Now, we're not in a class about the Vietnam War, but this is uh, a major consideration that Nixon and Kissinger had. They were linking a whole bunch of issues together, and they want to publicly support South Vietnam and make sure that it does not collapse. Privately, we don't know for certain 
there are scholars on either side of that argument. However, my humble opinion is that depending on the news cycle at the time, they leaned more more one way and leaned more another, with Kissinger being broadly more pessimistic about uh, South Vietnam's future and Nixon being broadly more optimistic and uh, I, I think kind of also valued its continued existence a little more because he was concerned about the you know uh, tide of communist revolution going around the world. Um, so here we get to the rising action where the first overtures were made on the part of the U.S. trying to reach out to the Chinese. So there was ping pong diplomacy in 1971. Nixon made speeches on many occasions saying how it's important to bring China into the international community. And in secret, Kissinger works through uh, the Pakistani president, actually, to communicate with top leaders in China, trying to get an invitation for Nixon to go to China. So Nixon uh, does not actually take part in any of these nitty-gritty discussions. As I said earlier, Kissinger is the chief negotiator, and Kissinger makes a secret visit to China in July 1971, where he spends a whirlwind, uh, a couple of days, all you know, just um, negotiating with Zhou Enlai and some of his other aides about the exact nature of this trip and what it meant for their two countries. And we're going to get into greater detail about what conclusions they came to, what agreement they came to later. Uh, but just know that those discussions were had by between Kissinger and Zhou Enlai. And uh, Kissinger actually had a very deep respect for Zhou Enlai. Um, and he actually said that Zhou Enlai is the most impressive foreign statement that he ever met. It's also important to see here that they agreed that this visit would not, uh, this is really important, that the U.S. was not recognizing the existence or the legitimacy, so to speak, of the PRC formally, but that they were beginning the process of formal recognition. So that's a big deal. So here we've come to the climax. Nixon shows up in Beijing, and here he is shaking hands with Zhou Enlai. Apparently, the reception was not quite as grand as they expected it to be. There was no crowds of, you know, flag-waving Chinese. But it was still a very warm reception, and they, they got along great, actually. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, this was a mostly symbolic trip, but there was the Shanghai communique, where both the U.S. and the Chinese published a public document talking about the future of China-U.S. relations. And so the details of that, uh, it's not actually that many. In fact, they just said, in principle, we will work towards normalization of relations. Uh, a huge, huge deal was that the U.S. recognized that there is only one China. They did not say what that meant, but they said that it was certainly not two Chinas, and it was certainly not one China, one Taiwan. There was only one indivisible China. And the U.S. agreed to end its military presence in Taiwan. Uh, in return, Zhou Enlai agreed to pressure the North Vietnamese to accept the terms of a peace treaty. And he was actually personal friends with Ho Chi Minh, them both having lived in Paris together. Um, and they became, they became lifelong friends. But... Um, you know, this was the an example of this is an example of linkage, where the U.S. gives something to the Chinese, right? Recognition of one China and an agreement to withdraw their troops from Taiwan in return for, uh, you know, Chinese pressure on the North Vietnamese. And he explained that it's in their interest to do so, because the vast majority of U.S. troops in Taiwan at the time were there purely to support the war effort in Vietnam. So it was a very compelling case. Um, and so after this, the U.S. is able to leverage these better agreements with the Soviet Union in their negotiations with Vietnam, and it also prompts the Helsinki process, wherein uh, East and West Germany acknowledge each other's existence, and human rights are uh, promoted among 
Eastern Bloc countries. It's very interesting to note that human rights are never a priority in Nixon's uh, discussions and negotiations with China. So some, some interesting class discussion could be had on the motivations for that. Why were human rights a priority for the negotiations in Europe, but were not a priority for negotiations in Asia? Um, and so uh, at the end, Nixon sweeps the US in 1972 because he's able to end the draft. The Vietnam War ends. Uh, and actually, Nixon and Kissinger both win the Nobel Peace Prize. But um, very soon, in 1975, the South collapses. Um, the U.S., uh, you know, they, they lost the Vietnam War. There is still significant re opposition to, quote-unquote, Red China and the Republican Party. And normalization of relations does not actually happen for several years under President Carter. because. Due to the Watergate scandal, Nixon's political capital practically completely vanishes, and he's not able to achieve very much. And, you know, Congress would much rather debate impeaching Nixon than in anything of substance, which, you know, makes me kind of think of the Trump administration a little bit. Interesting parallels. Um, but it's true that you know there is a it's certainly not clear cut one way or the other some objectives were achieved some were not and one of those was the whole taiwan issue the us still has military agreements with taiwan to protect it they still sell arms to it though there is no us soldiers there the us still has military bases around the world um Nuclear arms is still a contentious issue. And so um, I look forward to having our class discussion. And I think that no matter what you you come to uh, come to think about this whole era of detente, I think that we can all agree that it is certainly one of the most consequential eras f in modern history. And it goes a long way to understanding how we got to the world today because without this enormous pressure on nixon to end the vietnam war you know a lot of a lot of things just would not have happened and um you know we're going to talk a lot more about that in abby's presentation and uh, i look forward to seeing you all in class thank you